at 7.44. Is Theresa May's Brexit plan doomed? Over the weekend, her so-called Chequers proposal was rounded on by both the EU's chief negotiator and by those Brexiteers within her own party who think it's too soft and unworkable. Well, joining us now is the former Brexit Secretary, David Davis, who quit the Cabinet over the plan. Good morning to you, Mr Davis. Morning. The last time I saw you was at the <coughs> Spectator Summer Party, mm -hmm. just two days before the Chequers meeting, mm -hmm. and we were kind of pretty bullish about how you thought things would go. <laughs> Next thing I know, you've left. Mm -hmm. um, where we sit today yeah. seems to be almost the worst of all places, where nobody is happy, mm. where Boris Johnson is able to probably legitimately say that the scandal of Brexit is not that we've failed, but we haven't even tried to execute Brexit. And Theresa May is kind of stumbling towards what many fear will be a tremendous fudge mm. and one that the EU probably won't accept anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, is that a fair assessment? Well, it's not far off. I mean, the, the simple truth is we've made too big a concession, too many concessions in truth, but in this case, far too big a concession. If we got the Chequers proposal, and remember it's a proposal, as you said, not, not, a, not, not a deal, a, yeah. not a deal uh, then we will not have met the requirements of the British people. The British people voted in the referendum and in the election to leave the European Union, to take back control of our own laws, to take back control of our own borders. That won't happen with the Chequers proposal. So that's what's wrong with it, and that's why people are saying, we can't have this, we've got to have something else. We voted in the referendum uh, over two years ago, mm. and you were a Brexit secretary. Yeah. Do you hold your hands up and say, this is actually my failure? Because I just didn't do it well, in the time that I was in the job. No, I don't think that's. I don't, in that respect, that's why I said partially what, what Boris has said is right. But the, but the, oh, I didn't persuade the Prime Minister to do what I think we ought to do. So in that respect, yes, I failed. I failed to persuade my cabinet colleagues. I mean, most of them are Remainers. Bear in mind. Is that uh, the problem? It seems to yeah. me that <coughs> I voted Remain, but I, I have to be honest with you, I didn't really know. Right? I remember the debate over the Euro, mm. and I was persuaded, as editor of the Daily Mirror, by a lot of the people now screaming about, we've got to stay and remain, mm. uh, that they all said, if we didn't enter the Euro, it would be a complete disaster. Uh, the world will come to an end, I don't right? know. And it never yeah. happened. In fact, it was the best thing we never did. So mm. I, I'm sort of, you know, on the fence a bit about this. Mm. I, don't think, I don't think we really know. Mm. Uh, what I do know is, at the moment, it looks like we're not even going to try and do what the British people assumed we would be doing. Mm. I think that's a fair mm. summary of where we are. Mm. Well, that's you... why I resigned. I mean, look, you don't, you don't resign just on a whim. You don't, you know, it, 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 it was built up to over some months, but that's why I resigned, because we're not doing, we're not attempting to do what we promised the British people to do in our own manifesto. So should a pro-Brexit person who <clears throat> genuinely believes in the whole shebang <clears throat> is ideologically wedded to it, someone like Boris is clearly bidding for leadership here... Or you. Or you, or Michael Gove, or Nigel Farage, or Jacob Rees-Mogg, right? In other words, a real die-hard Brexiter. Would it be better for the country <laughs> if Theresa May stood aside and we had a Brexiter in charge? No, no, we don't, we don't, look, we don't need any more turbulence right now. What we need is a proper deal. Now, what's going to happen? How could we have any more turbulence than we currently have? Well, you, you could. I, I, really? I, I, oh, yeah, I've lived, I've lived through... Like you, I've lived through quite a lot of European Is debates that down the years. you don't want Boris Johnson to be no, Prime Minister? It's, it's, it's nothing to do with that. It's to do with the fact that I want this deal to be got right. And we've still got time to do that. But what's going to happen, and what I think is going to happen in the next couple of months, I suspect the Europeans will either turn it down or demand vastly, uh, a vastly greater consensus. Because they've got us over and, a barrel. And they won't get that. Well, I don't think that's true. I don't think we've... The, the part of the problem is we haven't tested them enough. We haven't said, no, we're not going to do that, and stood back and, and, and faced them down. And that, that always happens. But why would it, a Remainer like Theresa May well, do that? That's be, my point. Why not have someone like Boris, be, because, or whoever, who actually will do that because they genuinely believe it's because, the right thing because, to do? Because she, she's, she's learning, uh, as it were now, what, what lots of people in the party think. And it's not just, by the way, the Brexiteers. You've also got Nick Bowles, a leading Remainer, saying... Mm. This, this, this is a deal I can't live with. And there's a better deal available. Yeah, but he's uh, got well, a completely well, uh, different idea. Well, he, he you know, has, a whole he load has, of other people has, in but your but party. The point, there's no the point, one deal that the people point, can agree on. Well, that's, that's, that's why I say wait and see how this next two months plays out. It will get very, very tense. I promise you, it will be very tense. Everybody will be very afraid, too afraid, really, of the world trade options and the no-deal outcome. They'll all, both sides, this side of the, the, uh, the channel and the other side. 
And what will happen is people will then go back and say, OK, we're going to need to reset this. And what we'll reset it around is what Donald Tusk talked about six months or more ago, and that is a free, a proper classical free trade deal, like Canada. What I've called Canada plus, plus, plus on this program, uh, or free trade plus is a better way of putting it, that's where we're going to have to land. And, that, and we'll have to abandon checkers but you and come But you've already else. said you couldn't persuade the Prime Minister mm. of that. Mm. So how is she going to suddenly well, come up with well, that? Because, I mean, part of, the, part of the thing I said, one of the things I said at Chequers in the debate that took place in Cabinet is, this is not the end of the, the argument. You're going you're to be asked for more. And you cannot conceivably give more. You've already given yeah. too much. <clears throat> and that, that's what she'll realise, that she will not be able to get through Parliament a, a, a more compliant deal, a sort of Chequers Plus or Chequers Minus, whatever it is, uh, uh, than, than she's already offered. So she'll, if she'll, her plan she'll look gets at the reality. Rejected. She'll look at the reality and make a decision. And that's what we wanted to do. If it gets rejected, yeah. not least by the EU, but by the House of Commons, does her position automatically become untenable? No. No, no. Really? Oh, absolutely. If the Prime Minister's master plan is rejected by Look, her own parliament... We, we've had Prime Minister... When she, has, she doesn't have a proper majority anyway, you think she could stumble on? Yeah, well, it's not stumble on. She can carry on. I mean, the... the well, she's had, stumbling at the moment. We've, we've had, we've had, we've had uh, Prime Ministers before lose big votes. I mean, I, I was part of the campaign to stop the Syrian bombing vote uh, mm. uh, some years ago. That was huge. But the Syrian today. bombing but he, vote but he, but is he a foreign policy. That's a foreign mm. policy. Yeah, he didn't walk away. That's that, well, this is foreign policy. In, in but it's not... Domestic. This is the fundamental yeah, domestic future. And foreign, this is a yeah, fundamental yeah. decision about the future of this country for the next generation. Of course. This is. is a far bigger deal for Britain of course than the vote on bombing in Syria. So that's, that's, so that's why we should... So be we haven't been here before. So that's why we should be focusing on the deal, not on personality politics. Well, I, you know, I, I do think this gets in in the way, bluntly. So should Boris right not out. have done this today? Well, I don't, I, I don't, I, I've said already in the papers, I do not think we should conflate leadership issues with this big issue for the, for the country, for but, a whole okay. generation forward. But, but he, he is clearly making but Boris a bit... Will, Boris will do what Boris will do. I, but is he right to be doing it? It's up to him. But what I'm saying is what matters in all of this is not the personality politics, it's the outcome at the end. And we, we are, it's still perfectly possible to deliver that outcome, but there's going to be some argument to get there, and it's going to be quite tense. You couldn't deliver that outcome. You couldn't persuade the Prime Minister to sign up to what you believed in. David Cameron, the Prime Minister, resigned after he lost the referendum and he on have done, Brexit. He? But there we are. Was so. he gutless to walk away? No, I don't know that, but I just don't think it was the right thing to do. I said at the time, I said, look, you know, uh, we need as much stability as possible. I make the same argument now. I want as much stability as possible. I want the right outcome. Yeah, but Mr Davis, the point is, if a Prime Minister can't persuade their own country of their own vision, and David Cameron's vision was to remain, then of course they're going to have to go. And that's the problem for no, Theresa we're, May. We're, we're if she can't get her proposal through the House of Commons, yeah. then what, what authority well, she'll does come, she have? She'll come, well, as other Prime... Look, this is, the, the idea suddenly that one, you know, one vote or whatever uh, determines the future of Prime Minister over the years, time and time it's again, Prime Ministers have lost plan, votes and then come back and proposal. come back with a better outcome. One of the big barriers yeah. in all this has been the issue of the Irish border. And yesterday you were quite interesting about this. You, yeah. you were explaining that actually... Well, you underplay there is that al issue, There is already, you? actually, a lot of sort of agreements between both sides on the Irish border mm. in terms of VAT and so on. Just, just uh, elaborate on that a little yeah. bit. Explain why you don't think this is a deal-breaker. Well, first thing, just before we get to the actual technicalities, you know, we're not going to put up a hard border. We're not going to put up customs posts or watchtowers or whatever. Neither are the Irish government, no matter what the European Union says. So the idea that there will be a hard border is of itself... How do you dark. deal with movement of people well, over well, that border, which would be between the EU well, and I mean, the UK, we, we we, where had, we voted to take back we, control we, of our borders? We have had, since 1923, a thing called the Common tra uh, Travel Area. Irish... Uh, citizens are treated in Britain the same as British citizens. Not talking about and, Irish citizens. Well, but but what we about are. EU? You're talking about, you're no, talking, what about EU citizens We're talking about the from Irish outside border. of Ireland? We're talking about the Irish border. So, so that's the first thing to say. That, that, that border has existed as an open border for a very long time from a personnel point of view. The, and so there's been no checks. Because it's between two countries that view each other's citizens as identical, there's no, there's the, no but checks. But we're not going to view EU but we, citizens but we, but we, as but identical. But we, wait a minute. We never have taken that view on that border. The other aspects of the border, there's a border there on VAT, there's a border there on corporation tax. In fact, on all tax issues, there's a border there. On excise duty, there's a border. Uh, and so you know, those th things are done now without a visible border. They're done by cooperation between 
the Irish customs and the British customs. Uh, between cooperation between and the And is Garda your sense of all the people you... Because yeah. clearly you must have been having lots of conversations oh, yeah. about this. Yeah. Is your sense that behind the scenes, people that accept this, yeah. and but actually it's a bit of a red herring, the Irish border, being used as a big stick it to... Became, yeah, it is being used as a big stick. It became hyper-political. Uh, uh, that, that, that's the difficulty here. When we were dealing with it as a technical issue, it was fine. It was at, the, at the, uh, December of last year. Suddenly this became a central issue for the Taoiseach, for the mm -hmm. Irish Prime Minister. He, he went up 10 points in the polls after, after standing up to the Brits, as it were. So it's become a very political issue. At a technical level, it's perfectly soluble. And that, we shouldn't let that get in the way of everything else. Because, look, if we, if we end up leaving without a deal on World Trade Organization arrangements with a tariff barrier, the biggest loser by that would be the Irish, the Irish nation. If, if, we, if we get to the no-deal cliff top mm, yeah. and we go over it, right, my gut feeling has always been that in that eventuality... The other European countries will all have vested self-interest financially... That's true. ..in wanting to continue to trade with a massive trading partner yeah. like Britain. Is that your yes. absolute firm belief? Yes, it is. I mean, it, I'm, I'm neither... There are just dystopian views and utopian views of the no-deal outcome. I'm neither. I'm in the middle. Mm. There will be hitches, you know. Some people will try to make a point. There'll be some, uh, some uh, queues at Calais and so on. But there are lots of other ports. You know, there's Zeebrugge, there's Rotterdam, uh, there's uh, Antwerp, all of whom will want to get in more business if, if one of the other ports doesn't work. So, so yes, it will, it will be made to work. And okay. uh, everybody will make it before we let you go, I just want to mention yeah. uh, the death of a great American politician, Senator John McCain, yeah. who died. I had the honour of interviewing him many, many times when I worked in America. And funny enough, in one of the interviews, I asked him, he had an amazing story, as we know. He was a Vietnam prisoner of war. Mm. He could have come out two years earlier. He's been tortured and beaten and so on, but he, but he didn't. And this is what he told me when I said to him, what is the moment you'd relive again if you had a, a, a moment in time in your life? What has been the greatest moment of your life? If I could relive, outside of marriage and children, if I could have the power to let you relive five minutes of your life, what would you choose? Probably the day I left prison, and I left with all of my comrades when I left, and uh, earlier, a couple of years earlier, they had offered me to go home early, and I was so grateful that I had not accepted that offer and left my comrades behind. A remarkable man. You took him to, with Jeremy Corbyn. Well, I took, I took Jeremy Corbyn and a couple of others to go and see him because we wanted to get released from Guantanamo Bay, the last Brit in Guantanamo mm -hmm. Bay. And I thought, he's the perfect man. You know, a great American patriot. Mm -hmm. Nobody would see him as being soft, but he understood mm -hmm. what it's about to be kept in prison unjustly. Yeah. Yeah? And he stood up and spoke about it. Uh, and it was because of what he, inter what he did, his intervention, that Shakar Amir now lives in Battersea today, yeah. not, not in Cuba. Wow. Uh, so, fantastic man. You fantastic. know, McCain couldn't raise his arms above his head yeah. because of the torture he sustained. Yeah. And he could have got out years earlier, but refused unless yeah. his other prisoner of war yeah. mates came with him. Or, you know, the measure of courage? The measure of courage is what you do when other people aren't watching you. Mm. And that's what, you know, he exercised courage when the whole world mm. didn't know about him, really. You know, he exercised courage, yeah. absolute courage under those circumstances. You know, we talk about courage today, we talk about sort of sporting styles and so on. That's real. Oh, we need I a agree. bit more political courage. Um, David Davis, good to see you. Yeah. Uh, David <laughs> Davis, good to see you. Thank you very much. We've got